Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Morning. I'm in. I'm an alcoholic. First of all, I'd like to, I'd like to thank you for uh, for being here. Uh, it's a great honor and a privilege to be stood here. Looking at you guys here like it's sort of... I'm thinking, is this the Belgian version of the Colosseum, you know? I feel as if I'm, being, I'm about to be thrown to the drunks. <laughs> um, I'll, try, I'll try not to uh, give you a drunk a uh, I won't insult you with that because I think most of you know... Uh, what it's like, you've been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Uh, but time to time I will refer to, uh, to where I've been and how I managed to get here. Um, I, I've been an active, very, very active alcoholic addict for in excess of 30 years. And I didn't know why. I found out later that it was because alcohol altered my perception of reality. Took me from the boring, shitty life. I got to somewhere special, to somewhere brilliant, where I could be who I wanted to be, who I thought I should be. You know? Unfortunately, it kept taking me back, and then I had to go back, and over a long time, um, too long, too much, too often, I was physically addicted to it, and then uh, mentally as well. Uh, so, you know, I was in a no-win situation, but me being the arrogant shit that I am, I wouldn't have that. Um... I was quite successful, uh, lazy, but a perfectionist. Um, I had, <laughs> I had, uh, I had an excellent memory. It's a little bit pickled now, that's why I've got this piece of paper. Uh, I had an excellent memory, so I floated through all exams given to me. I owned a hotel, I owned uh, a pub. <laughs> that's good, isn't it, for an alcoholic? You don't have to steal your own booze. Um, I owned an offshore inspection company. I spent years traveling the world, got the gold Rolex and the diamond puzzle ring and all that shit, but it didn't mean anything eventually. And um, I went from that. I came, I went to live in Holland. I, I've been a heavy drinker all my life, you know, but I was a functioning alcoholic. And um, I went from having all the money, you know, the wife, the two beautiful kids, big detached house, the boat, the Jaguar, the old bag of tricks, to sleeping in doorways on the new Binnenbeck in Rotterdam. Um, that happened very, very quickly. Um, but what happened to me was, with the denials and everything, you know, I was earning silly money. And with my, with my sort of confidence there, I thought, well, this is going to go on forever, you know? I sort off into the desert or into the rainforest for months on end, inspect a few pipelines, come home with louds of money, and start again. Because I could use this to dry out, get well, get in the gym and everything, and come back. But I didn't know what it was doing to me. I didn't know what it was doing to my family. Uh, I ended, it ended up with me leaving my, leaving my wife. I didn't just leave my children, I deserted them. One was three, one was five. Um, and that was like 19 years ago. And now, thanks to my sobriety, I've just started a a relationship with my eldest son. The youngest one doesn't talk to me, but that's okay. Time will tell. Um, and what I did was, I was drinking my way. I came, I came from the Middle East, and I thought, where should I go and live? I didn't think Rotterdam, I thought Holland. You know, the land of the free and all this. So, pff, I went in there, got off the plane at Schiphol, jumped in a taxi. Cost me 20 times more in a taxi than it would in the train to go down to Rotterdam. But no, me being who I was, you know, the gold relics and the shit and the attitude, I thought we'd get a taxi. That was the beginning of the end. <laughs> I, so I jumped out of the taxi in Rotterdam. I didn't go looking for a flat or anything. No, hotel. Four star hotel. Here we go. Loads of dollars, you know. Flick, just flicking them across to the receptionist, like, you know. Me, me the big man, like, you know. And uh, from, from there, it ended up. Uh, he ended up with my booze and um, I won't go too much into the door but I, I, I hit the cocaine and the heroin trail as well um, and from there very 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 quickly I was a, I was a, a rich single man in in Holland and uh, well, some of the guys out there probably know what I'm talking about and I went for it and I went from there living in doorways I went to the Salvation Army uh, I was even banned from there for violence, for drinking, you know. I used to take a bottle of port with me to bed. 
and uh, they didn't like it. And I ended up in, in a place just outside uh, Rotterdam, sleeping under a bridge. I mean, I thought I was nearly a millionaire, Jaggy was the whole lot, sleeping under a bridge. I had a beard, right? It was a huge, great, sticky thing like this, you know? It looked like, it, it looked like a rhododendron bush. <laughs> and there was, and there was, there were things living in it. You know what I mean? You know? And I could, <laughs> and I could, I could smell the old mustache light in the morning to know where I'd been the night before, to see if I'd thrown up or anything, you know? And I, I got, I got a ponytail that was tied back and it was all greasy and slimy. My, my clothes were sticking to me. And I, I, I was, I used to lay under this bridge with a bottle of port and my crack pipe. Looking down at the world, that's your problem and that's your problem and you know, you've messed this up and if you just leave me alone I'll be okay. And, uh, but I still demanded your love and your respect. <laughs> you know what I mean? And here's me, this, this little smelly thing that's darting from bush to bush underneath the, underneath the bridge with little black stumps for teeth, right, you know? And I, I'm the business, the grandiosity was incredible. And what I didn't know, you didn't, you know, you, you had no idea of. When you spoke to me, when you were in my presence, you had to wear sunglasses. Because, because my brilliance was blinding, you know what I mean? And I went, I went, I went from bridge to bridge, from, to flop house. <laughs> flop, flop house to flop house and all this, you know. And then after, after God knows how many years of this, um, and it, it was one winter, I think, and it was a bit chilly, like, you know, I was wrapped up in my, in my stiff carpet, you know, the ice had started to form, like, you know, as I rolled it over, and it started to crack. And I thought, there's something wrong here. <laughs> what's, 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 <laughs> you know, this, this is not how I planned it, you know, this is, this is not my vision of the world, this is not the vision, this is not the world according to Ian. So I thought, well, I better stop. Or slow down, anyway, like, you know. So... <laughs> So I went from, I went from stealing vodka, there's no cops in it, anyway. I went from stealing vodka to drinking beer, you know, to chill, to get it sorted out like, you know. Well me, as an alcoholic, going from vodka to beer was like a passenger on the Titanic changing stools so they wouldn't drown. <laughs> it was total, total waste of time. So, a bit of, a bit of, a bit, a bit impolitically correct that, wasn't it? But anyway. Uh, and I didn't know why. I've detoxed, uh, God knows how many times, upstairs in what the Dutch call a solder, up in the attic where I lived. I'd moved out from the bridge by then. Uh, another couple of drunks took me in actually, they felt sorry for me. Um, I detoxed in this solder six, seven times, I don't know how many times, but it's a, a white knuckle job, you know. You're laid in bread, you know, you're sticky, a bucket next to the bed and a bottle just in case. Sweating, can't sleep, the air campaigns and all that. I didn't know it either at the time, but I wasn't just kicking off the booze, I was kicking off the other shit as well, you know. And that wasn't working. And during my time under the bridge and what have you, uh, I became quite an accomplished thief. I won't go into that, but occasionally I was caught. Uh, and in Holland they say to you, you know, if they don't lock you up straight away, they'll say to you, right, it's now, uh, it's now November, but if you come back in March, March the 6th, right, we'll put you in jail for three months. I said, yeah, yeah, okay, right, yeah, because they're full, you know, I mean, that's, and, uh, but I didn't like the idea, I mean, I'm not stupid, there's no way I'm going to go to jail in the summer, you know, in the winter, in the winter, okay, I, I can live with that, right, couple of months in the winter, under zero, below zero, like, I'm your man, get in there, and uh, I, used to, I used to actually look forward to going to jail, you know, because I got a shower, I could have a shave, I got, I got my Librium, I got my Codeine, uh, I got television, I got a shower, I got, you know, everything I wanted like, but not in the summer, forget that. And uh, anyway, I detoxed in jail six or seven times, um, and then I started to think, well, this is not working. Every time I, I came out of jail, the first thing I did was out the gates to the liquor shop. And uh, then I thought, well, what do I better, better seek some professional advice. So uh, I signed myself into this funny farm, and uh, they kept me there for about 11 weeks. And um, <laughs> they allowed me to go home for a weekend after two weeks. God, I hadn't even detoxed by then. So what was that? I could go on Friday night, come back on a Sunday, right? 
So I get out of the place on a Friday, go around the corner to the slider, you know, the off sales, the liquor store, buy a bottle, get merrily pitched, or like Friday night and Saturday, and not have a drink on Sunday. So when I, when I, when I gave the breathalyzer, I was okay when I got back on the Sunday. That's because I wasn't being taught anything. I was just going my own merry way, you know. And anyway, I, I was in and out of these clinics for about, I don't know, six or seven times. And it was just like uh, a revolving door. Uh, I'd walk in, looking like shit, feeling really ill, spend four to six weeks there, come out, and I used to white knuckle it sometimes. Uh, but there was one occasion, I walked to the end of the street, round the corner, there's only 200 yards, metres. Walked round the corner, looked up, my mate's just got a new floor, oh hey, Ian! That's it, ten minutes later I was in there with a beer. That's how it was, because I didn't know what the hell was going on. I know now. Uh, but my last time of detox, Oh yeah, um, a few years later on, when, uh, when you know, when I moved out from the bridge and when I, I upgraded, I ended up living in, in somebody's garden shed at the bottom of the garden. And uh, made me a bed, coffee machine. I thought it was a bee's knees, like two bottles of port, you know. Uh, and I, I was still, I was still keeping my, my my high principles. Like, there's nothing nothing worse than drinking cold port. So you have to stick it in your jacket to the body temperature. You know what I mean? And I used to lay there, and I was yellow. I'd got jaundice, you know, the liver was, my liver was sticking out from underneath my ribs and the whole bag of tricks. I'd gone, you know. Uh, you don't have to be Bart Simpson to be able to glow in the dark. <laughs> and luckily for me, uh, I mean, my ex-partner, <laughs> ex-partner, see, got that? She left me, or she threw me out a few days ago, like, because she can't deal with me now I'm sober. <laughs> my God, isn't that good? So, it's your attitude. I said, yeah, well, I'm sober, that's the problem. Um, but anyway, uh, I got into, I went, I went into this detox. I've been in this detox so many times, they sent me Christmas cards, they thought I was tough. <laughs> and uh, I got into this and I was really, really ill. I walked in the place and I gave him, I gave him a breathalyzer. And that's when I had my last drink. I had a bottle of port for breakfast, uh, which I'd done frequently over the years. Uh, I won't tell you the, the little city, little town I live in, but at six, this is how far my denial and how dangerous I was. Um, I used to have a, a, I used to wake up. I, I was living in what they call the Beast Boss, which is like a nature reserve. She'd throw me out again, like you know. And I, wor I worked for the, I was a, a refuse collection engineer. Uh, I drove a garbage truck, right? <laughs> so I got the, I got the thick uniform on, right, so I could sleep out. It wasn't, it wasn't a problem. So I'd wake up at like 5.30, 6 o'clock, drink a bottle of port, and then jump behind the steering wheel of a 40-ton garbage truck. Now, now, mate, we talk some serious denial. And just before this, I'd run my girlfriend's car into a bridge next to the jail, which was quite good, really, because I ended up doing six, doing six weeks in there for that. But this is what my denial was. I'm driving around very, very small, narrow, cobbled streets that are wet, the streets were so narrow, I used to have to fold the wing mirrors in to get down. And I used to hurtle down this, this, I won't give you the name of the street, but, uh, I used to hurtle down this street to get round the back of the church at the bottom to have another drink and get the crack pipe out. Because it got to the stage where I couldn't live with it and I couldn't live without it. Anyway, got into this, this uh, detox place. And uh, this woman said to me, I, who I'd known from, from ten years before, and she handed me this leaflet. She says, that in anything for you? I wrote that it. And it's a hospital in Scotland. And I said, I don't even know. But I'm willing to try anything. Because I'd gone. I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. I was on my, I was on my last leg, like, you know. And uh, anyway, I stayed in that place. I detoxed for six weeks. And well, actually, when I walked in, I had to, I got a breathalyzer. And I blew, and it was four point something, you know. And uh, the doctor looked at me and he said, you, bed, salt, bed, injections in the old bum. And he went to Holy for ten days. When he came back and he says, oh, you're late, knock you <laughs> Which in English, he's like, oh, you're still alive, kid. Even the doctor thought I was dying. Anyway, uh, they, they, they let me out of this clinic after I detoxed. And I was... Got the old spring in the step again, like, you know, and I'm ready for this, ready to fight it again. But something inside me told me, like, well, this is it now, kid, you know, you've gone as far as you're going to go. 
Uh, and I, and I couldn't go back to my girlfriend's, okay, so I told her I was going to stop drinking. Yes, so what, how many other, how many more times have you told me that, you know? So I couldn't go back there, and they wouldn't let me stay at the clinic, and I, um, my insurance wasn't paying for the hospital. So I got a tent, a sleeping bag, my fishing rod, a gas cooker, I went to live on an island in the middle of a river for about three weeks. Until I got permission, it's not of you, until I got permission to go to this hospital. Anyway, I arrived there. And the first thing I noticed, you know, I've got the old arrogance back. You know, I've got the gloves on. You know, I've done 20 minutes with the skipping rope. I was ready to fight this thing again. And I walked in. And uh, the first thing I noticed was the smiles. And laughter coming down the corridors. And it actually made me nervous, you know. Because I've been told, you know, this is a 12-step program that you're going to be taught, that you're going to be given. And uh, it's, uh, it's Alcoholics Anonymous based. I don't know, okay, I'd heard of Alcoholics Anonymous, right, but I didn't got a clue. I mean, I knew I was an alcoholic, but I didn't know what an actual, I didn't actually know what an alcoholic was. Anyway, I was going in there, and I, and I honestly believed at the time that psychologists, psychiatrists, counsellors and such like should be made to earn their money. So they were going to have a fight on their hands, like, you know, I wasn't giving in. You can't make me be happy. That sort of attitude. And... I got, I got in there like, and the guy, one guy came up to you, an American guy, ex-Vietnam vet, and he said, here's a book, it's a big book, first time I've ever seen it. He said, in there is everything you need to know. If you want it, we will help you get it. If you don't, there's the door. I thought, what? <laughs> what? This is a hospital, and he's telling me to, you know, go forth and multiply. <laughs> so, but it's, it, so it struck me, this guy was honest, you know, I'd seen this little badge, and it said, let go, let God. And I had visions of me walking in, and there'd be a priest stood there, you know, <laughs> or something like, all this, you know, bolts of thunder and all this, you will do this, you will do that, you know. And it wasn't. And I thought, well, okay then, I'll go for this. So off I went, they breathalyzed me, but I'd been, I hadn't had a drink for a few months, you know. The attitude was still there, of course. Uh, anyway, up I went, and the next morning, we had uh, a communal sort of prayer and meditation thing in the library. And they got the two big banners on there, and I just had to glance up. Now, all my life, I've always believed that, there's been, that there is something there. I haven't had the, sort of, the strict, sort of the, the, the strict vision of God. You know, this guy sat in a cloud with a beard and long hair. I've, not, I've never had that, but I've known there's something there. And I looked at the third step. God as I understand him. And I thought, okay, I'll have a slice of that. Nobody's, nobody's telling me what to do. Nobody's, you know, laying the law down. So, luckily for me, my, uh, my false pride and my arrogance and what have you went on a short holiday, which allowed me to start listening to these people. And it was the happiness that got me, the sincerity. These people didn't want anything from me, you know. I could take all I wanted, and there was, you know, there was no comeback. Unlike the booze, the booze was making me happy for years, and then boom, it was payback time. It wanted everything with interest, but these people didn't. They were great, absolutely wonderful, and I was, uh, I was gobsmacked. And I, I, when, I, when I was in there, I suddenly realised I belonged. This was me. These were my people. For years, I'd spent time with psychologists and shrinks, trying to explain what it was like being a drunk. I mean, the cops arrested me one time, and I, I was sat in, I was sat in blood paper overalls for, 20, for 72 hours, like, while they checked my clothes for blood and shit. And the guy said to me, the detective said to me, why do you do this? And me being a smart ass was going to come back with some smart answer. And I just looked at him and I said, I don't know. And I didn't. I didn't know why I was constantly getting pissed out of my brains, getting stoned, getting arrested. I used to wake up in the morning, open one eye, and if there was a steel mesh over the light, I knew I was in a prison cell. So I was reasonably safe. I'd be warm, I'd get food, a shower and a shave. But why was I there? That was the other side of it, you know. And in this place, I woke up and I felt free. It was great. And all I ever got was help and understanding. The love, you could feel it, you could smell it, you know, it was almost touchable. 
اول they gave me step one you see this do you? probably not that's her majesty's parachute regiment airborne to you Americans right? now now powerless surrender <laughs> yeah right powerless surrender her majesty's parachute regiment in ENS do not appear in the same sentence <laughs> surrender is not part of my vocabulary like you know forget it I'll do everything else but I ain't going to surrender you know you can kiss my hairy lily white forget that <laughs> forget the surrender business you know I'm going to fight I'll fight anything on two legs three legs four legs it doesn't matter to me I'll fight it you know and you can put me down I'll get up and I'll come back at you again you know but this thing I, I just couldn't I couldn't and we, I, eventually it sort of dawned on me that it wasn't really a surrender you know, this is me trying to wriggle out of it again, like, you know. It was accepting the bloody obvious. It dawned on me. I had what I call a thunk, you know. That's a thunk, yeah. That's a thought that hits you from a great height. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And it was, dunk, thunk. And it should have hit me, you know. I've been, I've been on the piss for all these years and I keep ending up in funny farms and jails. Like, and then they said that, you know, they, they told me like I was allergic to it. Yeah. You know, a guy that eats cheese, he, he breaks out in spots. If I drink alcohol, I break out in handcuffs and, uh, and things like that, you know. And I, and I had one of these thunks, it's like a, like being smacked in the face with a wet fish. And I thought, oh, this is it. I'm allergic to alcohol, I can't drink because it's going to kill me. Okay, I can live with that. And then, <laughs> you know, it was so bloody obvious I'd ignored it all these years. And I, and then it came to the part of your life's unmanageable. All these years, I've managed to get the best place under the bridge. I managed, I managed, I managed to, I managed to steal, I managed to steal all my booze. I managed to rip up the dealers. I managed. What's, you know, what's the problem like, you know? Anyway, I thought, like, okay, then, you know, it seems to be working for these guys. I'll go for it. And then the second step, right? Now, that, was, that wasn't bad, actually, the second step. Because I'd always believed there was something. And I thought, well, if I can't handle it, there must be something out there to handle it that can. And I was looking, more or less, at the therapists and the counsellors, you know. They, and, oh, yeah, all the, all the therapists and the counsellors in this place... The big difference is they're all recovering alcoholic addicts. That, I missed that, I missed that a bit. That's why it works. That's why I was willing to listen to them. That's why it wasn't going over the head, you know. Because we clicked straight away. As soon as I walked in with that arrogance, Tom, oops, oh well, never mind. Tom, Tom looked at me, the Vietnam vet, and he thought, pfft, I'll have him. <laughs> You're mine, boy. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, I, um, so he's from the south as well, you know, hi y'all being there. And um, anyway, he sort, of took, he sort of took me under his wing and he was great. He gave me that there. I love him for that. Serenity prayer. Anyway, oh God, I've lost track again. But anyway, I'm in this place. And then, okay, right, yeah, now the third step. I thought, okay, God, as I understand him. Well, I've always I've sort of had this vision, but I've been too afraid to voice that opinion in front of, peer, in front of my peers, yeah, in front of other people, you know. For getting put down, for getting, ah, you're the wuss, you're the sissy, and all that shit. God, what's that? You know, so I kept it to myself. Uh, but that little sauce me in the sub, that was actually quite easy. But for the first to the third step, one to three inclusive, were a doddle for me. Boom, gone. Once I got that thump, there it was, and away I went. And the step forward, step fourth, fourth step, the people were sort of, oh, to put it straight, they were shitting in the pants, you know? Oh my God! Well, I can't, I can't tell people this. I can't do that. I can't do the other. Well, me trying to wriggle out of the problem that I was in again, like the easy way. I thought, right, these people say do it, so I'm going to do it, and it's going to be a chance to dump all my garbage. So I went down to the local shop, got myself a shovel, and started digging all the shit, getting it on. I went as deep as far as I could. It was explained to me that do you want to go into cave the truth? Stick your head in, have a look round. Or come out just to say you've been there, or do you want to go in there, have a dig around and do it? And I thought, well, and one of the guys had said to me, look, if you don't do a good step four, if you don't do it to your utmost, 
there will be something there that will come back in the future and bite you in the ass. So no matter, and it has, because there's things that I wasn't quite aware of. They have come back and they bit me in the ass, you know. And so I went to it as far as I could. And the great thing with being in, a, in, in the hospital, I could sit around and do it with other people. You know, and it was, it became a bit of a game. Oh, I hate this guy because of this and I did this and something. Oh, I'll have one of them. And so I'd got like half a rainforest. You know? Loads and loads of it. But I wasn't, what amazed me was, I wasn't doing, uh, it wasn't a beat me, beat myself up session. It was a clear out. I was cleaning all that crap. And I once heard like, this, this little boy is looking at Michelangelo. Michelangelo's got this huge block of granite. No? Block of granite. He's going, chip, 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 chip. The visuals in this as well. Chip, 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 chip. Right. And the little boy looks at him and he says, what are you doing? He says, well, inside this huge block of stone, there is a beautiful statue of David. I'm just chipping away all the excess to find the statue that's in there. Or as get as close to it as possible. Hell, I'm no David, you know, but I mean, I can still keep chipping away to find out what's here. And that sort of stuck to me. And I was told, like your step four, think about your past as a dank, dark, dirty, smelly cellar full of your skeletons and all that. Get in there, open the doors, let some sunlight in. Because we all know vampires and shit, they can't live when the sun hits them. Get in there with a brush, clean it all out. Put it in a sack. That was my step four. I got the sack. And I moved on to step five. Now, I did my step five with an ex-Scottish police officer from Glasgow. <laughs> There's no way I'm going to bullshit this guy, you know. So I thought, okay, <laughs> here it is. So we went round, I got him his coffee and his sweet cakes and all that. And I went on for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. He said, yeah, okay, thank you very much. And I walked away. Six and seven were a doddle. I didn't burn or throw away my four, because I needed it for the eight. Right? <laughs> Did it. Eight, the nine, uh, I, I haven't done as much of that as I ought to. Because I live in Holland, I don't have much money, I have, uh, I've got an invalidity pension, and I can't afford to go over to the UK and the rest of the world. Because <laughs> wherever I've been, I've messed somebody's life up, you can guarantee it. But this, the people in the UK, I have to do. I will have a chance this year, I hope, when I go to the reunion. Uh, I've got to go down to see my son, see his mother and my parents and uh, loads of other things like that. Um, and the ten, uh, sorry, the nine, that's going to be difficult because with my pride and my arrogance, uh, I could easily write a letter, send an email. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, I won't do it again. No, 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 no. Direct amends. Up close and personal, face to face. That'll be the hardest thing for me. Ten, I do automatically. I'm now aware of when I mess up or when I hurt somebody's feelings or I do something that's not quite right. And it's a sort of a, sort of a constant thing. It's constantly running. Eleven, I talk to the boss all day. Oh, I call him the boss because I'm not. And it's constant chatter all the time. I talk more than he does like. He said, it's good that he's a listener. And the, <laughs> and the, and the, the, the step twelve is absolutely brilliant. I mean, as you can see, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very quiet, shy, retiring sort of person, you know. <laughs> and so, step 12, step 12 allows me to come out of my shell, you know. And I can, I can talk to people. But what it actually does is, it allows me to voice my thoughts in the direction of someone that needs it. And I can sharpen up the stuff that I'm doing. And it is brilliant. If, if reward was needed, if payment was needed, the look on somebody's face when the penny drops, or turning a tear into a smile, is God-given. It is absolutely astounding just to see that, you know. Uh, what this has done for me is, uh, I'm the new kid on the block, on the block. I've not been sold very long. Uh, and I've found that spirituality is the, is the direct essence of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's you people. It's 164 pages of a book and a bunch of drunks that worthless drunks that have, that have snatched me from a face worse than death. And that is no joke. This is not Hollywood crap. This is not, you know, a tour speaker giving you any bullshit. This is me talking. Without you people, I would be dead now. I would be gone. Finished. Uh, and it's, 
it's, uh, I found out it's, I have to move. The world's not going to change for me, so I have to change to fit into the world. And the first thing I had to do was like, in my step four, was get honest. Right? Honesty. The lack of intent to deceive. Tell the truth. Call it as it is. The Chinese have a proverb. And it's to know something, you have to call it by its name. If you're a drunk, if you're an alcoholic or whatever, say so. And it's not just for that. Don't wrap it up in cotton wool and say, oh, maybe I drink a bit too much on Saturdays. If you're a drunk, say so. Then you can deal with it. Because if you're, if you're hiding it, if you're putting it behind the door, if you're, if you're painting over it, you ain't going to do shit with it. It's going to get worse. Believe me, being there, done that, got the t-shirt. Get it out in the open and do it. Because once I've got stuff out in the open, you can't hurt me. Because I have no secrets. Nothing can hurt me. The power from my higher power, the power from God, the boss as I call him, comes from within. That's impregnable. It's not like putting a wall of denial up. It's not like putting a facade up. It's the power coming from me and the boss. The more fear I have, that tells me how, how, uh, how distant I am from my higher power. The closer I am to my higher power, the less fear I have. The less doubt. Okay, I won't get, I, I, I'm gonna lie to you. I was, I was sat there, and I got a bit of stage fright. You know what I mean? <laughs> Mama! You know, when, you know, when I, when I was asked to do this, when I was asked to be a, a guest speaker last August, I was, I was told, like, I was told, never, re- you know, re- never refuse to do anything if you're asked in AA. So, what do you mean, point? Straight away. Yes, of course I will. Yes, I'll do that. About half an hour later, I thought, what have I got myself into here? How do I wriggle out of this? Well, I thought, no, don't need to wriggle out of this. Because I am where I am, because that's exactly where I need to be. And I promptly didn't sleep for three weeks. <laughs> you know, living for the moment, as you do. <laughs> Just living for the second. And then it went away like, because I let my high power take over. <laughs> And then I decided I wanted to drive again. <laughs> and then that's it. I didn't sleep again for another couple of weeks. And then something came into my mind. I heard it. I think I probably heard it here for, for the second or third time. The war's over, son. Go home. Stop fighting. I can make certain decisions every morning. But I have no control over the outcome of the day. If I keep side of my, my side of the street clean, if I keep it sorted right, look after me, then, you know, my ch- the chances are that tomorrow will start fairly well. And that's brilliant about this. The, 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 the thing I like about the future is it only comes in small moments. And I know, and I know that God is not going to put too much on my plate. Everything that he puts on my plate for the 24 hours, I can finish it. If I don't finish it, that's up to me. But I can finish it. He's never going to give me too much. And he hasn't brought me all this way to shit on me and throw me out the door. I know for a fact he hasn't. You know, I'm here for some reason, you know. I was plucked unceremoniously, given a shake from under the bridge, dumped in a hospital, and then I'm being, now I'm in, a, I'm in the pit being thrown to a bunch of drunks. <laughs> and that's in, a very, that's in a very, very short period of time. And I can honestly, honestly say I have never been happier. I've, you might not believe this, but I have no resentments. I'm not angry for the first time in my life. And when I had my 18 months sobriety, my then partner, she said to me, what's it like after all those years of being drunk, you know, stoned and uh, higher than an eagle's, what you would call it. And me being who I am, I wanted to come back with something earth shattering and awe inspiring and all that. And I just came back and I said, safe. Because it was true. Safe. And I hadn't realised it, you know. Safe. And that's a fantastic feeling. It can't be bought. It can't be paid for. And I've, only, I've got it from you guys. And the... Oops. I don't know if this is still working. And the safety I feel, I, I get up every morning and I look forward to what's, what's, what's coming my way. You know, I don't run away from everything. And the spirituality for me is accepting who I am. Accepting who I am, what I am, where I am. 
because all this is for a reason. I believe if you want to kick the ball, go where the ball is. Don't go, don't go where you, where you want the ball to be or where you want, where you think the ball should be. You have to go where the ball is or you don't get a kick. <laughs> it's as simple as that, isn't it? You know? And the, these, these guys, I, I, you know, I, I was taught like, don't go anywhere near the near beer or anything like that, you know? So I don't. And I see these guys that, you know, they're, they're drinking this no point, no, 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 one hubbledy pup beer, you know, this no, no alcohol stuff. Well, that to me is like going in, it's like going into a, a bordel to listen to the piano player. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a, a waste of time, like, you know, I forget it, you know. I'll go down to him, I'll go down to his master's voice and get a couple of CDs if that's what I want, you know. So I, st I stay right away from it. This, 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 this thing, and you guys, it's giving me a joy for life. And I, and I read, uh, I read the, the reflections this morning. So you know what I'm going to say, don't you? Don't you? <laughs> oh, yeah, okay then. Uh, who's following the program then? <laughs> and uh, it actually says, see, look, I've written it down. Like, it actually says, glorious release. And that's what it is. See, look, he's checking up. Oh, he's not he's getting a tissue. <laughs> um, it actually says, glorious release. And that's exactly what I feel. I've been released. You know, I, Alcoholics Anonymous hasn't opened the doors to heaven to let me sort of waltz in. It's opened the doors to hell to let me out. And I honestly believe that. And the reason I kept relapsing was... I didn't know why, because I was fighting, fighting, fighting. And every time I got in the ring with this beast, I used to end up on my back, bleeding. Feeling very sorry for myself. Oh, poor me, poor me, you know. Why can't I do this, you know? And I found out that I had an illness, a malady, of the mind, body, and spirit. Start to work on it there, like. And every time, I mean, I was empty. Well, I wasn't empty. I was full of negativity. That's what took me to the booze and all the rest of the shit I was messing with. Now, every time I went into detox, they used to remove this quite successfully. When I was in there, I had no thoughts of it. But what they left was a gap. Whoops. What they left was a gaping hole, a void, right? An emptiness, a coldness that wasn't being filled. I wasn't being told to. Now, a vacuum does not exist naturally in nature. You can pump the gas out of a cylinder, blah, 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 but that's, that's natural. Even space, that's not a vacuum, because there's things out there. But when the booze and the dope was removed, then I was empty. And that emptiness, that vacuum, needed filling with something. And I just didn't know what to fill it with. White knuckles. Anger, resentment, growling, why can't I drink? Why can't I do what they're doing? Blah, blah, blah. Why do I always end up in hospital? I had a heart attack. An 8.4 on the Richter scale. I was in, I was in hospital for 12 days. I came out of hospital, right? Cheated my way onto the bus because I got no money. I told the bus driver somebody had stolen my wallet in the hospital. So I got on the bus, got off outside the supermarket, got two bottles of port, right? Down to the park, saw the coke dealer, got my bank pass off the coke dealer, because I owed him money. Went to the bank, got some money, paid him off and bought more coke. What's all that about? But with this, when I was given this, they removed all the crap. Well, most of it. They removed, removed all the crap. And then the emptiness was there. And then I started replacing the emptiness. I started filling myself up with the spirituality of Alcoholics Anonymous. I can feed on this. Not in an unhealthy way, because it's nurturing, you know? And I can take as much as I want, as much as I need, without emptying the pot, because it's been constantly refilled. And the more I put in there, the more I get out. The harder I work, the more benefits I get. Which I've never thought of. It's never, never, never even entered my head to give of me. You know, I walk past the, I walk past the guys on the streets and this and then I've handed them ten quid or twenty dollars or all this and that to me was given. Buy a guy a pint, pass him a joint, you know, all this, you know, help somebody with the phone bill. That isn't actually giving. To give of my to give of myself, 
it was much more rewarding. It's fantastic. It's unbelievable. Uh, and it's all, it's all down to you guys and my higher power. When it comes to trust, you know, to when I met Tom, I said, I, I'm Ian, the English guy. You know, I said, yeah, I'm Tom, the American guy. Within two minutes, he said, you don't trust anybody, do you? I said, no, I don't. I don't trust myself. So why should I trust you? And it was true. I didn't know where I was. I didn't know where I was going. Uh, but I started to sit down. I took, I'll, I'll give you the printable version. I took the cotton wool out of my ears and put it in my mouth. There is another version, but this is a mixed audience, so I won't bother with that. It's shut the... Anyway. And I started to listen. And the more I listened, the more I understood, the more I wanted. But I wasn't chasing it. I wasn't growling. I wasn't running around like a lunatic. And it came slowly. It's like an osmosis. I'm sort of absor absorbing it bit by bit. And I found that what I do enjoy doing is giving, like do, doing something for someone as opposed to doing somewhat, something to someone. Now that's a big, big difference for me in my, my life. Uh, and when, when I handed it all over and I realized that getting through my fear, because all I've ever got here is love and understanding. I have nothing to be afraid of. Freedom, true freedom, is just the other side of fear. I've never known such freedom as I did since I handed it over. I can't drive worth a shit, so I get out of the driving seat, you'll get in. When I did that, it was as if I was, I'd been living in a, in a, in a hut in, in the Canadian Rockies or something, surrounded by snow. I have to go outside every day to collect wood for the fire, the light and the heat. When I accepted God into my life, when I handed it all over, it was as if I just had electricity installed and I just had to click the switch. There was no more fighting, tramping through the snow and all the rest of the shit. It was already installed. I could just get on with my life as it was. And the stuff I have in me now, it's, I, I find it very, very difficult to explain. I, I pray for help in this because... I have a need to pass on the feelings I have. This, 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 this spirituality stuff, it's difficult for me to explain, but it's like walking past a wall that's just been weighted. You're bumping, painted, you know? You bump into it and it rubs off on you. And you don't know it's there. But being around you people, it soaks in. Of course I've got to put the work in, I've got to work the steps, I've got to do this, that and that. But it's uh, incredible. I'm, I'm sort of running out of steam here a bit now. Uh... It's, I don't know, it's all because of you guys. I love every single one of you to bits. Without you, I would be dead. I was sat there before I came up, and a nice French lady was doing her bit. And I've never cried in AA. But I came, I'm close to tears now. I came close to tears there, like, you know, that's why I was looking down and ignoring you. Uh, the bottom lip's going a bit, actually. Uh, and don't forget, I'm, I'm a staff sergeant in the parachute regiment. We don't cry, like, you know what I mean? Uh, but that's what it's given me. It's given me feelings. It's given me the ability to love my, my fellow man. It's given me something that can't be taken away. You can torture me. You can cut my toes off. You can, you know, you can tie knots in my willy, poke me in the eye with a sharp stick. But you can never, never take away what I've got. From what I've got from you people. And uh, I, I try not to anticipate the future, you know, we've all, we've all heard it, you know, one foot in yesterday, one foot in tomorrow, and you're shitting on today. That works for me. I try to live just for the minute and enjoy the minute. Enjoy this moment. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, I think I'll, I'll think I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you for being here. I love you all. And may your God go with you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.